or welcome to the show. Uh, yeah. Did did uh, Ukrainian forces actually invade Russia? Well, they've yes. We'll, we'll make it simple. Uh, they crossed the border uh, in the Kursk region. It was lightly defended by Russia, uh, but you know this is uh, being played to the propaganda uh, hilt because uh, the the reaction of the both the Ukrainian authorities and most importantly, the U.S. news media, the U.S. think tanks. My God, they're, they're celebrating this uh, like it was th- that they're Germans and this was the start of the Battle of the Bulge. You know, oh, we're sweeping the Americans from the field. There's, they're taking over Russia. Russia's on its heels. It, it, it's, it's the most absurd thing I, I think we've seen in the course of this entire war. Because it looks like the the total force that the Ukrainians launched across the border was uh, maybe two thousand men, possibly three thousand. Um, w- what's worth noting is that the Russians killed at least fifteen hundred of those within the first two days. So it's not exactly like uh, they're they're rolling to victory. Uh, it, this has been a this has been a PR win. But it's it's really of it has a, a short shelf life. Uh, the expiration date on it, I think, was uh, on Sunday, uh, because the, the, their original goal, it appears, was to to get close to the nuclear power plant in Kursk, and maybe even take control of it. Uh, they failed to do that. Uh, what we've learned is that the Russians are very effective at quickly mobilizing and deploying their personnel to the scene. And uh, it's just, it's you know, they're slaughtering the Ukrainians. That's the simple fact. Here's uh, uh, President Putin, excuse me, excuse me, President Zelensky boasting uh, about <clears throat> all of this, uh, Larry. Cut number three, Chris. Today. Today, I received several reports from Commander-in-Chief Sersky regarding the front lines and our actions to push the war onto the aggressor's territory. I am grateful to every unit of the Defense Forces, ensuring that Ukraine is proving that it can indeed restore justice and ensure the necessary pressure on the aggressor. Restore, restore justice and ensure the necessary pressure on the aggressor. This has to be a PR stunt, Larry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know... The cocaine cowboy needs to stop shoving the nose candy up into his empty head. I mean, this is uh, this is delusion, delusional territory here. Um, the what they did is they took some of their best units, and, and they can't even you know. Let, let's let's point out a brigade, a normal sized brigade, is around two thousand uh, soldiers. Right. So at, at maximum, they use, uh, it looks like they use one, possibly two brigades. And these were some of their best units. And they were having to cobble these together and they pulled them away from fending off the Russians and the Donbass, moved them north to do this. Now, it, it's one thing if you can, it's not just being able to cross the border and be able to sit inside a, a school or a business or a city hall for uh, 12 hours. Can you actually go in, take control, and sustain your presence? And that's what we're not seeing. What does take control mean? Oust the local government and install your own? Yeah, where take control means uh, nobody moves on the streets without your permission, number one. You control who comes in, who goes out. Okay. Uh, you, 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 it's, it's actually, you know, the, the full control of of all activity, both from uh, you know what the what the people who live there do to anybody from the outside that comes in, and you know Ukraine doesn't have control. They've they've been accredited with taking this one village. I think it's called Suja, and the, the fact of the matter is they're on the outskirts of it. Uh, they they haven't even se- secured the entire area, but. Uh, the, uh, what's more important is it looks like this thing was planned with NATO. So this mm-hmm. was not this was not just a Ukrainian. They didn't just come up with this idea on their own. Is the um, 
uh, are the Ukrainians attempting to set fire to or destroy the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant? Yeah, they did hit it with a drone yesterday. And that's why I said this was a, I think this was a coordinated plan. Their, their, their goal was first to, to reach and get, if not control of the Kursk nuclear power plant, at least uh, bring it under, let's call fire control, where they could, they'd be close enough with artillery that they could shoot at it. Now, that raises a whole other question. If they get close enough with artillery, you know, how in the world are they going to resupply those artillery batteries with the actual shells to fire? You know, but let's just enter the world of fantasy and pretend that they can do that. Um, but then in taking control of the cursed plant, then they were going to also, they also launched, they had this other attack that they launched uh, yesterday where they hit one of the cooling towers with a drone and set it on fire. Now, this is, this is really crossing a, a nuclear red line when you start attacking one of those facilities. Because in, in theory, if you take out one of the cooling towers, you could potentially compromise the entire nuclear facility. And, and you know, you could be back in a potential Chernobyl range of a meltdown. Now, Russia has the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which is the largest one in all of Europe has been uh, on very, you know, it's been shut down uh, operating on just uh, keeping the reactors going without having it uh, actually operating at full blast. But nonetheless, uh, it appears that the goal of this was that, that Ukraine was going to get control of the Kursk power plant and then use that as a bargaining chip, as leverage with the Russians saying, okay, you give us back Zaporizhia, we'll give you back Kursk. That way, from a Ukrainian standpoint, they say that they'd be saving face. All right. So we're to just just to clarify this and educate me if I'm incorrect. We're talking about two power plants here. Correct. We're talking about the Zaporizhia <clears throat> one, which is in Ukraine. It, they attacked their own power plant. And then we're talking about one outside of Kursk, which they have attempted to but failed to secure in an effort to engage in some kind of a, a switch. Correct. So if, if people are looking at a map, um, uh, if you, the Donbass is, you know, in the center of the country. And it, so just go out to the nine o'clock position, you know, like you're look, looking at a clock face. That's where roughly the Zaporizhia power plant, a nuclear power plant is. It's located on, on the river, near the river, the Dnieper River, uh, in the, like the center of this. And it, Zaporizhia is one of the territories that uh, uh, Russia annexed in the election. And, and, and Russia's had control of this plant for, since the, the, the second day, I believe, of this uh, begin, beginning of the special military operation. So they've had it, you know, for more than two and a half years. Is it online? Is it operative? Does it, does yeah. it produce power for Ukrainian people? No, no, it's not. It hasn't been producing for it, it was, uh, not much, no. They've got the Russians. The Russians have gradually shut it down. So they, the the reactors are still on, but it is not operating at full power to provide uh, electricity not only to Ukraine but to other parts of Europe. Uh, so as like I said, this is this is the biggest facility of the of its type uh, in Europe. Uh, but the Russians have had control of it. Uh, the Ukrainians have fired some. Uh, you know, mortars, rockets, artillery, uh, and, and hit it with some drones in the past, but haven't done any damage. Hitting it uh, Sunday with that drone in the in the cooling tower and starting that fire, that's significant. Now, what's interesting is Zelensky came out uh, late yesterday and said, oh, no, we didn't do that. That's, that's the Russians. And uh, he, he made two different claims, either that the Russians set a bunch of tires on fire to make it look like it was burning, or that it was the Russians who bombed it themselves. I, I think he finally realized that uh, he was in trouble, that their plan to, you know, try to do a trade of Kursk for Zaporizhia was literally blowing up. Chris, can you put that map right uh, up, the one you just had there? So we see Kursk, uh, and we see the symbol for the uh, Kursk, or as... Um, McGovern says, correcting me, Kursk nuclear power plant. 
Yeah. Where where is Zaporizhia on this map, Larry? What is it near? Yeah, you see where that uh, you see down there where it says Ukraine. Yes. Just sort of, just sort of under the U. It, it'd be oh. down around that area. Okay. A little bit, a little bit in, uh, in to the to the west of it or to the left as you're looking at the map. Okay. Uh, has uh, Kursk now been surrounded? by Russian troops so as to contain the uh, Ukrainian troops there that have, they've not yet killed. Yeah, well, the Ukrainians haven't made it that far north. So they're still about uh, 25 to 30 kilometers to the south. Uh, they, they, they've they occupied uh, some different villages. I, I want to emphasize occupied and are digging in because the, the Russians are just, they're hitting them very, very hard. I mean, they're getting bombed, they're getting strafed. Uh, the, the columns of vehicles that, the, that Ukrainians uh, were operating from have been blown up. You can see in, the, in some of the initial videos, they were they did move quickly and they bypassed some of the uh, defensive positions that the Russians had. The, and their goal was to get as fast as possible up towards Kursk and to uh, at least put it under uh, fire control. You know, that means that you can hit it with an artillery piece or with mortar or whatever they're firing. Uh, they failed to do that. And it is true that the Russians were caught off guard. But, you know, some people that have drawn on the West have drawn parallels with this as a, like the Battle of the Bulge. And, yeah, there was a similarity in that in the Battle of the Bulge, Germans dressed up in American uniforms and uh, over took over a certain... Uh, key outposts, and the the Ukrainians apparently did the same thing. They they dressed up in Russian uniforms and took over some of the border control posts. Uh, but uh, that's about where the similarities uh, end, uh, because the the Russians responded very very quickly. It took it took the United States during the Battle of the Bulge you know, a week. Uh, to try to be able to, you know, really get its get its act together, uh, the Russians were moving within 24 hours, and I think I think there's really sort of an interesting, uh, let's call it a silver lining to this, that Russia is now going to be able to move large concentrations of its forces up into that region that would have been that I think they were planning to do for uh, launching a move on Kiev. Um, or, or, or into uh, Sumi. And this now gives them cover for action mm. because they, they can say, hey, you know, we're, just, we're deploying all these troops because we got all these crazy Ukrainians running around. And so that it's actually it works out uh, from a, both a tactical and strategic level uh, of a benefit for the Russians. But as far as this, you know, creating any kind of pressure on Russia to negotiate with Ukraine is doing just the opposite. You know, Russia is not going to negotiate. Russia is not in a weak position. Russia is not losing. Russia is not faced internal political turmoil. And the West is just, man, they're whistling past the graveyard. Here's uh, President Putin on Friday evening uh, commenting uh, on these events. Cut number four. As you know, the Kyiv regime has undertaken another large-scale provocation and launched indiscriminate shelling of civilian buildings, residential houses, ambulances with different types of weapons, including missiles. Western media claims that uh, the Kremlin is in panic. Yeah. Uh, an another PR stunt probably fomented by western intel yeah the same western media that claimed joe biden's in charge okay so <laughs> you know they they just make it up to fit to fit whatever the narrative is that they want i, I mean it really it, it, it's shocking the level of self-deception and lies that fill western media they, they, to try to actually get an honest assessment of what's going on you know, it, it'd be look. It'd be one thing. I, I had one. I saw one comment on one of the blogs that I uh, post that uh, yesterday, saying that I was I was in denial because 
the Ukrainians had deployed 10 divisions. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and the person writing this is a moron. A division that, you know, anywhere between, you know, 10 to 25,000 troops. <laughs> so if, if Ukraine deployed, you're telling me they deployed a hundred to a quarter of a million troops to curse? Now, if they did that, yeah, that would be significant, okay? That would be an eye catcher. But that didn't happen. They're having the, the, the reports from other fronts, even from Western media in some cases, are conceding that, uh, you know, a, a normal sized brigade is supposed to be 2,000 guys. Uh, Ukraine's having trouble filling up a battalion, which is around 500. And in some cases, they're saying they, they were down to like 20 troops, which is like a platoon. So, you, you know, the, the manpower shortage Ukraine is facing is real. And it is compounded by the fact that they don't have uh, the, the bounty of weapons and, and machines and, and vehicles that they had uh, a year ago. So <clears throat> without that, there's no way to sustain any kind of operation. Uh, this is this is like trying to run a marathon, but you don't take a drink of water ever. Mm. Uh, you'll make it about 10 miles. Colonel uh, <clears throat> McGregor uh, reports this morning that uh, President Putin has indicated that there will be no negotiations because of this uh, incursion into Kursk and because of the uh, attack uh, on the uh, nuclear power plant. Yeah. Well, I, so uh, this is going to have the opposite effect from what they uh, from what they hope. You you were right. you were saying one hundred thousand and two hundred and fifty thousand troops. They don't have that many troops in all of Ukraine, do they? Well, they probably have. They're probably I think the total troop strength uh, throughout is not saying those who are up on the line fighting is is probably around three hundred thousand uh, right now. But they're, they're at a clear disadvantage. Remember when this when this war started or when this operation started, because the war has been going on since 2014, um, the Ukrainians had an active duty force of around 750,000. And the Russians went into Ukraine with, you know, it's estimated anywhere from 100 to 180,000 troops. So the, they, they went against complete, uh, doctrine, military doctrine with respect to an attacking force, which says that, hey, uh, if if I'm going to attack you and you're in an entrenched position, I better bring three of me for every one of you, mm. you know, three to four times the size. Well, it was just the opposite. Uh, the Russians were one fourth the strength. Well, that's not the case today. So uh, the the Russians have been, you know, steadily recruiting. They're not having to go out and grab people off the street and shove them in the back of a van like the Ukrainians are in order to make some of the recruiting numbers. Uh, people are signing up. Uh, the Russians even have raised the price that people who are signing up on a contract are getting paid uh, because, you know, they're in, the, the economics are at work. They're in a, a tight labor market, so they have to pay more to uh, get some people in. But the point is they're getting them in, they're training them, and they're, and they're spending at least six months in training, which is exactly how it should be, unlike Ukraine. So uh, the, the, the test comes when you have an incident like what has taken place at Kursk, uh, that can they deploy their troops rapidly? And once the troops arrive, do they know what to do? Can they operate? And that's exactly what you saw the, the Russians do. They were able to pinpoint the movements. They were able to deploy their troops uh, into that region. And now they're just, they're content to let the Ukrainians sort of dig in and, and, and be killed because so, Larry, all of this, uh, grabbing people, impressing them as the legal phrase off the streets and forcing them into the military, an absence of uh, serious training, sending neophytes largely untrained, uh, to the front lines, uh, the incursion into Russia. Aren't these indications that the end is near in all but the public um, acknowledgement of it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's look, let, let's just reflect back. You know, remember uh, 
during World War II, we referenced the Battle of the Bulge, which started in December of 1944, and uh, they terminated it probably in January uh, of uh, 45. Well, Hitler didn't surrender until May, and the Germans continued to fight here and there. But it's not a matter of can they, you know, can they pick up a gun, you know, fire a cartridge at you, or fire an artillery shell. Yeah, can they still kill? Yeah, th that's going to continue for a bit. But the real question is, do they have the resources, the manpower, and the geographic uh, positions to prevail? And Ukraine doesn't have that. It, it is, it's, it's politically dead, but it's still walking around. It's like that chicken, you cut its head off, it still can run around. Uh, that's what Ukraine's doing right now. They're running around without their head, and judging by their decision to go into curse like this, it it was pretty brainless. Switching uh, gears before we conclude, <clears throat> uh, Larry, uh, how soon do you expect the Iranians uh, to retaliate on Israel for the uh, assassination in Tehran? I don't know. They're taking their time. The, the, what's a, what's alarming about this from the Western standpoint is, I, I heard it from another friend yesterday, that the, the U.S. intelligence community has reached the, they've reached the decision, and this is what they're telling top policymakers, whether you know in the Biden administration, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, across the board, and members of Congress, they're telling them that. Uh, Iran is not going to launch a major attack, that Iran is having second thoughts, that Iran basically is afraid. It talks tough, but it's not going to do anything. I'm going, oh, man. That, I mean, that's, I, I believe that that's absolutely wrong, that we are confusing uh, preparation for uh, cowardice or fear. And the what what's taking place is Iran in, in conjunction with Russia is building up its defenses because they realize they hit Israel Israel is going to try to re retaliate and I think Iran's goal is to again send a message but this time they're going to hurt Israel by taking out a military base destroying a key intelligence uh, center but they don't want to do it in such a way that they are perceived as trying to destroy Israel and conquer Israel. And they've got the aid of the Russians. So the Russians are sending in not just uh, anti-ballistic uh, you know, missile defense systems, the S-400 in particular, but they're sending electronic warfare capabilities in. But most importantly, they're sending trained Russian soldiers that operate those units and those systems. And those are being deployed around the country. Uh, that is both, uh, I think, to ensure or reassure the Iranians that they're not alone in this and that they're not going to have to stand up to the might of the West by themselves. But it's also designed by Russia to send a, send a signal to the United States and to Israel that, you know, you, you keep talking to the Israelis about doing a preemptive strike. You know, be careful because we've got uh, Russian soldiers on the ground, and any attack on them is going to be viewed as an attack on Russia. Is and, this going to be another uh, proxy war of the U.S. <clears throat> against Russia, even though the combatants will be Israel and Iran? Um, I, I, I can't rule out the possibility that someone's proposed that, but my God, that'd be incredibly stupid. Uh, because... Uh, in this case, Iran, uh, you know, I, I, I dealt with somebody yesterday who was uh, suggesting that what, what Israel is going to do is they're going to hit Iran with a massive cyber attack and that'll take out Iran. And I had to remind him of 2012. This is 12 years ago, the Stuxnet virus. So in that Stuxnet, the Stuxnet virus was a, it was a computer virus that was designed to attack and destroy uh, the uh, reactors and the, the processors for uranium uh, in, in Iran. Well, 
the United States developed it, and it was a, and it wasn't supposed to be used. But Israel got its hands on it. They launched that attack, and the way you have to launch that attack, you literally have to put it like on a thumb drive, and get it inside these buildings physically, because they're usually walled off so that they are not accessible from just somebody on the internet surfing along. Well, that Stuxnet virus got out of control, went around the world, and it actually blew back on the United States. But the point was, out of that, Iran developed a very robust cyber army where they then recognized, okay, we're playing in the big leagues now. And they stepped up and they have a very robust cyber capability that candidly hasn't been unleashed on Israel or the United States with any kind of force or fury. So Iran's taking its time, but they have been quite specific that they will make Israel pay for what Israel did by killing the uh, uh, the, the the head of the Politburo for Hamas, Hania, uh, in, in in during the presidential inauguration. Because it's not just this one. There have been a series of assassinations, and their concern is to send Israel a message that in the future, if you do this again, you will pay a higher price. Because up to this point, Israel hasn't paid a high price at all. Larry Johnson, thank you, my dear friend. Very, very uh, illuminating. I very much appreciate all this, especially the detailed explanation of the Ukrainian incursion into uh, into Kursk. Very, uh, very helpful, Larry. Uh, we'll see you again.